Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, this is Quick Bites, when the Food Foundation brings you snap analysis of recent events in food policy. Um, as usual, we're recording so that you can share the recording afterwards with any friends and colleagues that you think might find the conversation useful. And I'm really, really thrilled that today we have um, Dr. Francesco Branca, who directs WHO's nutrition work, and uh, Jason Montez, who's uh, one of the scientists in his team, are here today to talk about the recent guidance which the World Health Organization has put out on the use of sweeteners. Francesco, Jason, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation and good morning to you and all. Yes, thank you, pleasure. So I'm particularly pleased to see Francesco again because we used to work a lot together when I was um, in my last job at the what was the Department for International Development working on on nutrition in low and middle income countries and um, we did a lot of work together and Francesco so it's it's really lovely to see you again and have an opportunity for a reconnection professionally. Um, so. We're going to start by, um, I'd love to hear from you really about uh, what the reaction to the guidance has been. I think there was quite a lot of anticipation of the guidance coming out. I'm keen to understand from you, you know, what, how significant this moment was from well, the, the perspective of WHO and what's the reaction been from different countries? Well, um, we somehow anticipated this reaction because our practice is before we launch a guidelines, we put up a, a draft for public consultation because we want to hear from uh, uh, the public, from academicians, from governments, from stakeholders. We, we did collect a number of uh, rea uh, reactions and, and maybe Jason can tell you some details about that. And we also, uh, indicate what our response is to that. And, and of course, you know, on the one hand, we had, uh, you know, very positive and encouraging responses from scientists and public health advocates who have been uh, somehow calling for the attention to sweeteners for a number of years. And on the other hand, uh, we had uh, a concerned reaction from um, companies who have been relying uh, on uh, the substitution of sugars with sweeteners to continue promoting their products. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a divided reaction. And uh, of course, some of the uh, governments who have uh, given this as an escape route on, on sugar reduction, you know, need to reconsider maybe this approach, but we can talk about that later. So. Yeah, yeah, okay. Very good. Um, so let's just do a little bit of kind of ground clearing at the beginning. So people who haven't had a chance to read the guidance just understand a bit of the scope. So I'll summarize what I've got from the scope and you must tell me where I've uh, uh, got it wrong or missed something. So importantly, this is not guidance for people who are suffering from type two diabetes or it's for the general population. That seems to be a really important qualifier. Um, it doesn't get into the differences between different types of sweeteners, which is, I think, also another important qualifier. I'm assuming that's because there's just not sufficient evidence to do that at this point. It doesn't set out safe levels of consumption. Um, and am I right in thinking also it, its scope really is around weight and healthy weight? You don't really get into tooth decay, sort of other consequences of shifting perhaps from sugar to sweeteners. Is that does that broadly summarize the scope or are there other things that's important to highlight to people? Sure, no, thanks Anna. I think you have uh, correctly summarized. I think that uh, maybe the history of the garland is important because uh, uh, we developed uh, now almost 10 years ago guidelines on the reduction of sugar. And uh, we've been suggesting to reduce sugar uh, consumption to less than 10%, possibly less than 5% of the energy of the diet. And so the question came, okay, how do we do that? Is it okay to put sweeteners instead? And uh, clearly the outcome are similar to the one that uh, the sugar garden were looking at. So that was particularly the, 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 the weight uh, 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 gain uh, outcome. And so the garden very clearly says, and it's a very simple message, uh, WHO suggests that non-sugar sweeteners not be used as a means of achieving weight control or reducing the risk of non-communicable diseases. So we're talking about weight control, non-communicable diseases, and we're saying, look, 
This is not an option. So nothing to do with the safety of it. I mean, the, the, the safety is a responsibility of other bodies. And uh, in fact, uh, we have one body which is advising the Codex Alimentarius that WHO and FAO coordinate. It's called the Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives. The other ones were talking about the safety. The other ones were establishing uh, the acceptable daily intake levels of the individual sweeteners. I mean, we have a complexity here because we're talking about all the non-sugar sweeteners in, in one go, uh, except some, um, some that have not been included, but you know, it, it's, a com it's, a combined, uh, it's a combined approach. Okay, so you've um, you read out there the 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 you know the main recommendation. WHO suggests that non-sugar sweeteners not be used as a means of achieving weight control or reducing the risk of non-communicable diseases. Now it's called a conditional recommendation. I'm interested to understand: is this usual? I mean, is it quite common for WHO guidelines to have conditional recommendations like this? Is this just you anticipate that this will be revisited in time once the strength of the evidence has has improved. Just explain what it means that that terminology. So, so, uh, and, and maybe I'll ask Jason to comment on that, and also on the on the evidence we have. I think there's two elements. One is our assessment of the evidence, and we're very transparent about that. And in in this case, I mean, the, the quality of the evidence has limitations clearly. Uh, you know, normally our strength, uh, the strength of the evidence is, is determined by the type of studies and our strongest evidence come, comes from randomized controlled trials. In this case, we have we had to use a lot of the prospective uh, um, studies, uh, not, not necessarily of the strongest quality. So, but that has, that's an element. The other element is the conditionality, which uh, it, it takes into account the fact that actually uh, there are uh, different uh, contexts, uh, different levels of, of, of consumptions. Uh, uh, there are uh, several variables uh, uh, that are affecting that kind of consumption. So in a sense, you need to look at the context. So conditional means look at the context. We're not saying you know, uh, that policymakers should take this as, as a recommendation to go for a ban, but we're basically raising a red flag saying, you know, you know if and, and the, as, as you all know, the increase uh, in the use of non-sugar sweeteners has been vast and dramatic. And so they are very pervasive. So basically, we're saying red flag. I mean, don't believe that this is a solution. So maybe we should sort of start, uh, you know, a, a new trend of, uh, you know, at least we shouldn't increase that trend. But it's very much context dependent. There are some situations in which maybe this is less of, a, of an issue or a concern. So conditional means you know, before you take any policy action, look at the context. Okay, that's helpful. So let's let's move on. And it, it, it's presumably quite common for conditional guidance to come out from WHO for well, this sort of within have, this scenario. You know, yeah, we have a we have a combination of of strong and conditional. But okay. uh, yeah, we try to be, of course, as clear as possible with our recommendation and and, and give a strong recommendation whenever it's warranted. But you know we are we are saying, again accepting the the reality of the evidence and the complexity of the decision mm -hmm. to make and and in yeah I would say probably the Jason what is the majority is probably str strong and in a few cases we have conditional you know probably it's what two thirds one third I mean just uh, <laughs> out of my top, head yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah probably and and then you know as Francesco mentioned um, there are there are many additional factors that are considered in addition to whether or not an intervention is effective. So we, we look at things like acceptability and feasibility and, and resource implications and impact on equity and human rights. And, and at the end of the day, we sort of say, you know, what is the upside and what is the downside? And we try to balance that. Um, and if the yeah. balance favors the upside, then, then we are more inclined to issue a strong, but I would say it's maybe, maybe closer to half half, but, but yeah, we do issue quite a few strong as well. Okay, I'm keen to get onto the policy implications, but I think it's important for us to just uh, summarize for people, you know, what the evidence is that you highlight. Now, um, so Jason, my understanding is that there are there's a sort of body of evidence which is primarily from randomized control trials, which tend to be shorter term, and some of that shows positive impacts on weight for or BMI for um, the in the use of sweeteners. But when you look at long-term observational studies, you 
you don't see any effect. And in fact, you tend to see the reverse, whereby uh, people that are eating, consuming more sweeteners tend to have higher BMI. Um, have I have I summarized that correctly? And uh, and then it would be good if you could touch on this challenge around reverse causality for the mm -hmm. long term, the long term trials. Yeah. No, I think in a nutshell, that's a very good summary. In fact, the, the evidence is quite a bit more um, nuanced. To really get into it, you have to unpack it. But but in a, yeah, the top line result is that um, in the short term, there is a small decrease in body weight when you compare sugars to non-sugar sweeteners. Also, we don't see much of an impact on um, markers of disease, so no, no strong mm -hmm. impact on glucose, insulin, um, cholesterol, blood pressure. But then we see kind of the, the, river, the exact opposite in the long-term studies. We see either no effect on, on body weight or, or increased um, body weight or increased incidence of obesity. And then we see increased risk of um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and in fact, increased risk of premature mortality. So we have these kind of conflicting results. Um, and, and, and it is important to point out, as, as you noted, the, the randomized controlled trials, almost all of them, a good majority of them were about three months or less. Um, when we're talking about the prospective cohort studies, these are uh, some of these are followed up for many years, sometimes decades. So mm -hmm. there is a big difference there too, in terms of, of um, follow-up in, in a study. And of course, then the difference in how these studies are, are conducted, it's really you know, real world in the cohort studies versus sort of experimentally controlled conditions. Um, and then, you know, so, so as Francesco mentioned earlier, you know, RCTs are generally considered the gold standard because they're randomized, they're controlled, and uh, you try to take care of any sort, uh, any chance of bias. And in, in prospective cohort studies, there is a higher risk of um, bias. There's uh, always a concern that maybe there's some confounding, which, you, you know, nowadays most authors will do some extensive adjustments for confounders, and confounders can be things like other lifestyle factors that might contribute to the outcome you're interested in. So smoking, you know, is, is, the, is mm -hmm. that group smoking? Are they exercising, et cetera? Most of that is usually controlled for now. And in, in most of the studies that we assessed in the systematic review, they did really, you know, a great job in um, addressing confounding. There's always a concern for residual confounding, something you didn't know about beforehand. Um, and then of course, um, you know, one of the um, concerns about, observational studies, uh, cohort studies, and, and in this case in particular is, is reverse causality, as you mentioned, reverse causation. And that's where simply um, the effect that you're interested in or the outcome you're interested in, it, it's sort of a reverse relationship. So people who are already overweight are now, you know, they've decided that they're going to start using non-sugar sweeteners. And then when you take that group at the beginning of the study that you know they're already predisposed to obesity and maybe they're already at higher risk for diabetes or, or cardiovascular disease and so that's really what reverse causation is um, and of course the authors of the studies that we included in our review were well aware of this so they they made every effort possible to address this so they did things like they exclude they didn't actually start assessing people for say type 2 diabetes with, until like three years after the study started so that anybody who was already really sort of at high risk and, and, and developed diabetes, they wouldn't have been captured. They, they, they waited. They did other things such as, um, you know, restricting um, uh, or, or, or sort of um, adjusting for body weight to make sure that that wasn't impacting risk of disease. So there were <coughs> a number of things that the study authors did. And, and in almost all cases, certainly for the diabetes, the, the association that we saw didn't change. And sometimes in some cases it got stronger. Um, so we feel that that although there's always that possibility that reverse causation played some role, the, the likelihood that it was the only reason we're seeing what we're seeing is probably pretty remote. And there mm -hmm. have actually been some studies subsequent to, to our review that have looked at that more directly and, and, it, and supports the notion that, um, that, yeah, what we're seeing is probably real and not just an artifact of, of residual confounding or reverse causation. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. So let's let's that sets the scene now for for moving on and really thinking about what this means for policy. And and obviously, we're particularly interested in this case and what it means for policy in the UK. Um, as you said, Francesco, at the start in your one of your comments, um, you talked that different countries have going down 
slightly different routes in terms of the amount of sugar they're recommending. We've taken a pretty uh, tough stance, I think, in the UK in terms of setting out our ambition to have sugar contribute 5% of, of dietary energy. So overall, so we've got an, an ambitious goal and we're a long way off it. Um, but we did um, we did start, I think, probably the, the our sort of most effective step in the right direction was five years ago when we introduced the sugary drinks industry levy in the UK, um, which, yeah, had its fifth birthday um, last month. Um, and I think there's a lot of conversation going on now in the UK about what it's widely been regarded as a success, that that policy. Um, I'd be interested to know what you think about it. Um, but also, obviously, sweeteners have been a huge part of that story because a lot of the drinks have replaced um, sugar with sweeteners. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear your reflections on what do you think that means we should be doing next in the UK in terms of what would be your advice to the UK government about where we go next, particularly in the light of this evidence that or, or the guidelines that you've now published. Yeah, de definitely the sugar levy, as well as other um, taxation schemes used in the world have uh, been very important and very effective. Um, we have some good evaluation data from Chile, for example, indicated that some of the, or from Mexico, indicating some of these measures actually are very important to reduce uh, um, sugar and energy intake. So many countries are, are now uh, adopting this. Uh, um, at the World Health Assembly last week, uh, all countries basically endorsed what we call the package of the best buys, and taxation is one of them. Nobody, nobody was disagreeing on that. Uh, so we're, we're going to see, and in fact, WHO is actually about to produce guidelines on um, taxation of sugar sweetened beverages, and we have a manual. So I think this is this is a policy area which is going to expand. Now, uh, what could be uh, next? Uh, um, I think our guidelines on sweeteners uh, indicate a potential different approach, which is, uh, let's not try to keep the same level of sweetness in food, you know, mm -hmm. simply by replacing with, uh, with something else that is sweet and it's not having calories. Let's try to reduce the sweetness of foods altogether. So uh, that means uh, we're certainly working on reformulation, but certainly working on the offer of food uh, in public institution. And we do believe that uh, this needs to happen very early in life. So we need to look at children's food environment uh, and uh, you know, using uh, uh, very sweet food as a, as a, as a treat, uh, you know, is that a way to go? And, and, and I think, I think there's, there's a lot that can be done to um, get the population more accustomed to lower uh, sweetness level. I think that's probably the most, uh, the most important uh, consideration. We also need to maybe find a way to measure that level of sweetness, uh, because you know the amount of sweeteners, uh, it's not necessarily an easy uh, indication that the, the, the sweetening power of the sweeteners is yeah. very variable. Some of them, yeah. you know, very tiny amount can still give you the sweetness. So, so I think that's uh, that's the important uh, thing to do. Then maybe our guidelines indicate that there are. Um, policy measures such as nutrient profiling, uh, uh, labels or, and taxes that need to consider this element. So that would, that would again, uh, help the reformulation effort. Okay, so let's um, touch on the first of those around, around sweetness. I think it's sweetness. I think it's a really, um, a really important point. Um, we've just been actually, the team have been over the last couple of weeks, been doing a very um, deep dive into uh, the yogurt category in the UK. Sorry. <laughs> it's a bit strange, but we are, um, we have a, a set of, of asks of supermarkets around uh, the cost of living in particular, and wanting to make sure that some of those categories of food that children are very dependent on that the cheapest products are not those that are least healthy but what we're finding when we look into the yogurt category is that a lot of the cheap products they don't necessarily have a a high level of uh added free sugar um but they do have 
a lot of sweeteners in them. So they're very sweet yogurts, um, but which do well when it comes to the nutrient, the, the UK's nutrient profile model. They're not scoring particularly badly. <clears throat> and uh, certainly it made me realise um, just looking at the that that particular category, as you say, how sort of pervasive the sweeteners have now become in, in efforts to reformulate away from from having sugar in um but i think probably unlike salt i mean i my understanding from the reformulation program that's gone on in the uk around around salt at least historically when it was quite successful that actually it was a process of adjusting people's palates okay. so that they um got to the point where they found that what they had previously been eating now find too salty to eat, exactly. you know, so a sort of sense of adjusting those palates. Right. But it doesn't seem to me that we're we're quite on that journey with sugar. Um, do you think, yeah, yeah, I'd be interested in your reflections on that. And what are, uh, how are other countries handling this challenge uh, uh, in terms of sweetness? What What are other countries trying to help people move on that that journey away from needing things to be quite so sweet. Mm. I, I I don't believe we have much happening there. Um, I, from WHO point of view, we are considering uh, to do something similar as we did for for sodium, which is to look at sugar benchmarks. But but again, that 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 sugar and added sugar. So you know, without uh, clear metrics uh, that tells us what the sweetness of the food is, you know, it will be difficult to do that. Um, so I think I think we'll, we need to find some maybe good examples. And that, that's why I'm saying, you know, let's start from children's food, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's looking at the recipes of, um, of those products. I mean, it's not just the added sugar per se, but, you know, the, the fruit extracts component, for example, mm -hmm. is something that needs to be considered. So, so I think that we need to do some perhaps research and give some good examples of what can happen. Actually, there are some interesting reformulated products, uh, you know, some, somewhere in the world that, that could be brought as, uh, as examples. Um, but, you know, definitely it's possible. I mean, the adjustment uh, to a sweet uh, taste uh, is also relatively rapid, as we have seen for sodium. And as you say, uh, you know, if it's done at the population level, then there will be a you know, progressive adjustment. Uh, I think that if we start from children, uh, we will be able to, um, I think, do a lot of progress. Yeah. Maybe okay. I could just add, sorry, Anna. Yeah, uh, please do. You know, yeah. Because you mentioned sodium. I mean, the, the sort of sensory response to, to sodium and, and, sh and sugar or sweet, I should say, is quite different. I mean, um, sweet taste has this sort of uh, hedonistic component and, and I'm sure you've seen studies where they've, some have suggested it's addictive and, and yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's a bit, I think more of a challenge, but as Francesco said, the bottom line is it's still a physiological response. It's a conditioned response. Um, it's a sensory response. So, so it can be done and, and it just, you know, a gradual um, approach would, would, would do the trick. Mm. I mean, I was struck as I say, going back, going back to yogurts is that actually, unlike in the, in continental Europe, um, it's actually very difficult to get single portion completely un, unsweet yogurts, like natural yeah. natural yogurts. And they actually that's also quite a lovely food to eat, but it's just not really available in the on the UK market to the extent that it is in, in mainland Europe. Also in continental Europe. I mean I'm having a hard time to find in France uh, unsweetened products. So <laughs> are you okay? Right, that's interesting. <laughs> um yeah so um there's quite some way to go that there. Tell us a little bit about, um, you mentioned when we were talking previously that some countries have have included the use of sweeteners within the, nutri well, have they included sweeteners within the nutrient profile model? Because at the moment, as I said, with the yogurt challenge, these products are all, if you, sweeteners are just not being caught through that process. What, what are other countries doing are there are some good examples you can cite which are being a little bit more sensitive to this sweetness challenge? Well, I mean, I, I think many countries are sensitive. Some countries have acted on that. I mean, the sensitivity, I mean, you, I'm sure that people um, 
in the every we we talk about it. Uh, is it better to remove uh, a drink with sugar and then you know allow a drink with sweeteners? I mean, this is not natural. So I think that people have uh, somehow reaction to that. But um, so the debate is there. But some countries have acted on it, particularly uh, like to say Colombia has introduced a tax. Uh, on uh, ultra processed food, they actually use this concept and this category, and that includes also uh, the sweeteners contact. I mean, this this okay. is a tax that's going to be implemented in November 2023. So we, you know, it's interesting to see what's uh, what's going to happen. Um, other countries include sweeteners in warning labels. So Mexico is a specific warning label, you know, the, the the black hexagons uh, that uh, highlight uh, the excess in. Uh, sugar, fat, salt, and energy, they have also a warning label on, on the sweeteners. Um, South Africa is also going to have a specific warning uh, label. That is uh, actually, that's starting from 2025, but you know, that, and other countries are, are, you know, also saying that. I mean, in Israel, for example, they have a warning on the content specifically of aspartame. You know, there's been a lot of discussion about aspartame mm. specifically, but more as a source of phenylalanine. So for, for people with phenylketonuria, rather than um, a warning on the sweetener per se. But so, so I think more is the, the, the warnings than the taxation. But uh, yeah, it, somehow we start to see the sweeteners being put in the same category as, uh, as sugars, uh, more perhaps on the argument that uh, they are additives and and they are also in a sense a marker of the degree of processing of the food they yeah, for okay. the nutritional content okay that's interesting i'm interested to hear about the colombia uh tax on ultra processed food is that being that's a sales based tax is it how's it being levied uh yeah it's a sale based tax um yeah, honestly i don't have much the detail yet of how it's going to be implemented we just heard recently about it and uh, but they're using the concept of ultra processed food, which is quite interesting. And as you know, the concept has been um, developed in the Brazilian context, and there is a classification of food which is sort of improving, uh, called the Nova classification, mm -hmm. and, and and that sort of divides the foods into minimally processed, uh, processed, and 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 uh, ultra processed. And, and the ultra processed that element of uh, you know, basically not having uh, any uh, any connection with the original ingredients. So it's more like uh, components of ingredients that are brought together. And, and usually these are products which are high in fat, sugar and salt, but also products which are extremely convenient, long shelf life, uh, you know, relatively cheap, uh, potentially with an addictive, uh, uh, you know, capacity. So they have been associated to actually non-communicable diseases, uh, obesity. So, so it, we don't use that uh, definition in WHO. We, we actually um, are going to do some work on that. Uh, we have been looking at the degree of processing versus uh, um, health outcomes, uh, but you know somehow there's a complexity around the definition. You know, are we looking more at the content, or are we looking more at the um, uh, processing uh, technologies? Mm -hmm. So, so I think I think we, we need to have some clarity there. So it's interesting to see how a country has actually done that, and and you know also what kind of concrete challenges they will have in applying the taxation to specific categories of products. Yeah, okay, well, that might well be a subject of a future Quick Bites is perhaps we can talk to somebody from Colombia about when that tax gets introduced to hear how it's going. Um, thank you both so much. This has been a, a really interesting conversation. Really appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom with us. I think it gives us a lot to think about in terms of um, what comes next um, here in the UK. Um, so thank you both. And um, just a reminder, thank you to everybody who's joined us online to listen. Really appreciate it. We always welcome, welcome your feedback. Um, please do share the recording with colleagues if you can. And don't forget to look out for and subscribe to our award-winning podcast, which is available on Spotify if you search for the Food Foundation and you'll hear more um, of this kind of conversation and analysis about what's going on in food. So thank you both very much and look forward to seeing you again soon. Likewise, thank you thank very you much. Thank you for having us, yes. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.